Okay. Apologize. Apologies. I, I didn't start recording when the meeting started. <coughs> Okay, um, so I'll be presenting our property evaluation today. Um, our introductory slide today is um, from a recent prescribed burn at Watermelon Pond Preserve at the Gladman Tract. Um, and it's uh, what a lot of the land management staff has been engaged in recently, um, conducting prescribed burns to uh, obviously maintain and improve the health of the properties that the ACF program manages. Um, so it's just a pretty picture uh, in that regard. Out of curiosity, is it too dry now? Are you guys holding too off? Dry now. <laughs> our, yeah, too dry. our last burn was about two weeks, two and a half weeks ago. Cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and minimize um, the faces just so there's better viewing on the slides. Um, the property that you all will um, be hearing about today is the High Springs Lime Rock Mine LLC. It's actually a property that's owned by three lease limited corporations, um, all with similar names, but um, we didn't list all of the names uh, of the three different LLCs. Um, it is it does not fall within one of the strategic ecosystems. Um, and so therefore it does not have a score for the, um, for the REPA. The project scored um, 5.07 out of 10. It's 316.97 acres in size, so almost 317 acres. Uh, one parcel, and again it's under three ownerships. The three owners are three LLCs that are comprised of members of uh, a related family, an extended family. Um, there are five buildings on the site currently, and those buildings are associated with the mine operation. Um, they include two scale houses, an older one that's no longer in use, and a newer scale house, uh, an older mobile home that um, was utilized as an office historically, a pull barn for equipment storage and a shed, a small shed. The uh, Latchville County property appraiser's uh, just value for the property is $108,940, or $344 an acre, and the total value from the property appraiser is $124,870, or $394 an acre. The landowners do not currently have an asking price for the property. Um, they're, they're still considering um, what is reasonable. Um, and uh, it, this is nominated as a fee simple acquisition. You can see the property that it's fully filled in with the red color on this map. Um, it's just northeast of the town of High Springs um, and, and fairly close but west to Interstate 75. Um, you can see it, it doesn't fall within one of the existing Alachua County Forever um, project areas. That's that mint green color, the lighter green color. Um, there is a project area in High Springs, a uh, 17 acre site within the city limits. And so that, that's why it's been grouped in the High Springs project area. That's the closest project area functionally for that, for that property. Um, the closest county preserve is Mill Creek Preserve, uh, and then there's a conservation easement to the west on the Santa Fe River, Camp Palakwa. Here's a zoomed in aerial photo of the property, and you can see um, that there are a couple roads that access the property. Um, one, the one in the center, Northwest 198th Terrace, is a private road. Um, and that's the one that's utilized for access to the site, to the interior of the site. And there is still active mining going on on the site. Uh, you can see those two more white looking spots in the north central portion of the property. That's where the active removal of lime rock is still occurring. Um, and the, the 198th Terrace is the haul route that the trucks use to go in and out. But to the west, 202nd Street is a public road and 218th Avenue on the east side is a public road as well. So there is public road access to the property. Um, the other thing you can note from this property, from this aerial photo, is that um, there's a fairly 
large footprint of surface water on the site. Um, that's probably one of the most notable features of the site. Um, of, of that almost 317 acres, approximately 142 are surface water. Um, the remaining upland footprint that you see is primarily overburdened from the line, mining operation, with the exception of a little square on the central east side, which is the footprint of a historic cemetery. Um, the, there's also a little pocket on the southern boundary that appears not to have been mined as well that's, that's um, got a forested cover type on it, but we were not able to access that particular spot during the site evaluation. Zooming out, you can see um, the size of some of the adjacent parcels. I know that's always a question. Um, for our group looking at connectivity of the site at the landscape level. Um, there are two larger parcels and one more moderate sized one to the south. The one immediately to the south is still forested. That's the Sensmere property. I'm probably not saying that right. Um, and, and then aside from that, there are sort of uh, individual family estate lots or, or home lots for the most part surrounding the property. There are a couple larger um, parcels going north that end up intersecting County Road 236 uh, that have not been cleared. Um, that's Burnett and Wellborn. Um, and that's sort of the context for the property in the landscape. And then the soils, the soil map um, here again uh, is not it's not a typical soil map at, that like we present for the majority of our evaluations because the site has been mined and the footprint of the, the upland land on the site has changed over time as a result of that mining. So um, just note that the, the darker blue is indicated as water pits and dumps, but that's, that shape of that blue is reflective of when the soil mapping was done because again, the, the land shape has actively changed over time as the site's been mined and overburden's been placed in, in different areas um, throughout that process. And I just wanted to show um, a 1999 aerial photo of the property because this is about the time in the history on the site when mining stopped on the south end, that's below that divided red line. And that divided red line represents the historic footprint of one of the public roads that crossed the property. Um, so south of that divided red line, um, at about 1999, um, removal of lime rock had stopped. And that is a little bit after um, mining had started north on the north side. Um, so the area south on the south side has had longer time to recover. The vegetation on site has had a longer period of time to recover. Um, and the area on, on the north side, again, there's still a little bit of active um, mining that's going on on that north end. I think the, the main feature on the site and, and the feature that the, the landowners um, have, have enjoyed from a recreational perspective for quite a while, and I'd like at this time to point out that um, one of the landowners is here, um, Ms. Linda Sodek, and so she'll be able to answer questions if um, the LCD has questions during this process. Um, so one of the, the features that the landowners have most enjoyed on the site are the open water that um, features that have been created through the, basically the quarry lakes that were um, constructed on site um, through the mining process. I've divided the images of them into the southern lakes and the northern lakes, um, reflective of that different age period. So these are the southern lakes, these are the ones that were mined first. They're fairly steep-sided across the property and hitting depths of 35 to 50 feet in some places, um, which means they're intersecting the Florida aquifer. So they're, they're surface waters that are directly connected, basically, to the Florida aquifer. Um, that has provided wonderful opportunities for the family to utilize those areas for fishing and boating and swimming. Um, and they additionally have used the site for camping as well. Um, and they are, it's a unique, um, for Florida, definitely a un unique landscape um, in that regard for this part of Florida. They do, oh, a little overlap on my text there, but they do um, have a boat ramp constructed on site that uh, is able to access all of those southern 
lakes. Um, the northern lakes are, um, again, because there's still some active mining going on, they are not utilized as actively. <coughs> the, I'm just going to briefly make sure no one's waiting to get in. Okay. Um, the upland areas, again, are primarily overburden, mining overburden, that has sort of been reshaped on the site. Um, there are areas that are that slope downward. The whole footprint of the site is in a slight depression overall from the surrounding landscape because of that mining history. Um, so there are areas that do slope actively downward towards the southern lakes, and then there are areas that have more sort of noticeable hill-like topography within the site or almost terraced topography. Over the majority of that overburden, there's um, almost complete ground cover of a grass that I could not identify. Not known to me as a non-native invasive grass, very possibly a, a non-native grass, but it, it's, not one, it's not one I was able to identify, but it's not a known non-native invasive grass. Um, we did actually find wire grass in quite a few places mixed in with that grass, which was fairly surprising um, in walking around the site. Additionally, in that southern area that has had a longer period of time to recover, there's a mixed uh, shrub and tree canopy, and the, the dominant tree canopy or tree species in that mixed shrub tree canopy is red cedar. And cedars are species that do tend to do well on uh, disturbed sites or mining sites, um, not just in Florida. Um, and so that's not particularly surprising. There's also a mix of um, early successional oaks. Um, in the shrub layer, there are wax myrtle, salt bush, um, American beautyberry, uh, almost, you know, consistently native species, but native species that do well with disturbance. Um, we, we, when we did the site visit, uh, Ryan and I did the site visit, um, we were able to visit the site with um, the landowner's, Ms. Sodek's brother and, and his wife, and uh, they were able to show us quite a few areas on how to navigate around the site and also kind of explain the family's use. And the family has owned this site throughout the mining history. Um, so they've seen how the shape of the contour of the co contours of the upland have changed um, with the, the removal of the lime, lime rock from the site. You can see here the slopes a little bit more illustrated in um, these photos. This is probably, rep that sloping aspect is probably represented on maybe 15% of the uplands, and the remainder of the uplands are more in these, this sort of level plateau. There are a few areas where you can see some of the, um, I, I'm not that familiar with lime rock mining to know what the quality of the product was, but that some of the lime rock product was deposited in sort of small mounds as if it was maybe didn't meet the standards for the material they were hauling at the time. So there are a few areas where these sort of uneven um, mounds occur on the site. Um, and those, again, similarly revegetated with um, the shrubs that do well in ruderal sites and, and cedar and others. Again, we saw wire grass in a surprising number of locations in the uplands. We did see one patch of uh, one of the native spiranthes orchid species. Moving north on the site, the northern quarry lakes, the ones that are still actively being mined, um, are a, quite uh, extensive in, in terms of the vista that you have uh, looking across them. Um, you can see there's sort of that sharp relief on the far edge on the southern image here. And there's also the, an irregular nature to the lake edge um, uh, in the other picture and in the pictures here in this next slide. Um, there, there's still heavy equipment moving through this area. They're obviously actively working that pile of lime rock in the upper picture. Um, you can see there's a sort of a terrace on the edge in the water uh, along the edge of the um, lake that drops off pretty dramatically as you go deeper into the water. Um, the edge is not um, perfectly uh, uniform. There's some cracking in, in some of the areas that I, I just don't know enough about um, 
management of these sites to know what that means in terms of compaction of the lime rock or stability. Um, but it's obvious that, you know, while heavy equipment is still working, these sites are going to change somewhat. Um, from a more elevated, one of the more elevated mounds, this is looking across one of those northern quarry lakes. You can see a fairly unique vista for Florida. Moving over to the east side of the property, the one area that has intact um, the, the natural community that would have been on site is still intact is the footprint of the cemetery. It's approximately a three acre historic cemetery. Um, it is in the Florida Master Site File um, indicating establishment around 1881. Um, and it's classified as an abandoned cemetery. So um, while obviously there would be some clearing associated with the individual grave sites, um, the successional hardwoods in that area, which probably would have been upland hardwood forest, are, are recapturing the site um, uh, over time. Overall, especially given the amount of disturbance there is associated with um, lime rock mining, there there was a surprisingly low amount of um, non-native invasive species. We did see one patch of kogan grass in the older area that's no longer being actively mined. There were scattered lantana in a few different places. And the two ferns on the left-hand side, Chinese break fern and tuberous sword fern, are both strongly associated with, with limestone. Um, and so that was not a surprise to see them there. The one non-native invasive species that was more widespread in the water was hydrilla. Um, and the, primarily, this, we observed it in the southern quarry lakes. And that's not uncommon um, to, to be moved on boat motors. Um, this is a contained site in terms of outward flow. Uh, but if there were to be broader recreational use of the site, management of the hydrilla would be an important component to not spread it to other sites. Um, in terms of resources on the site, um, beyond the surface waters, there are still stockpiles of lime rock on the site that are being um, hauled off at a lower rate. The family has a contract with um, a Lime Rock Mining Corporate Company right now that they do have the right of um, cancellation for um, at, at their discretion. Um, until such a point where that occurs, um, the corporation is basically hauling off enough lime rock to pay the family the royalty fees for, for having access to the site. So it's very low level mining operation right now. And what remains to be removed are those two white footprints from the first map that you saw. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, of course, there is some infrastructure associated with the mining operation on the site. Uh, the upper left is the old scale house. Um, upper right is the open pole barn with some equipment storage, and there is a, um, like a vehicle maintenance pad to the right of that equipment. Two above ground storage tanks for fuel, one is gasoline, one is diesel, and um, that mobile home that is uh, an older office. There's very little solid waste on the site overall, given the, the size of the property. Um, the, the primary things that were observed were there was a stockpile of old tires, probably from the heavy equipment associated with the mining operation, and intermixed with that, a couple of barrels. Um, and then in that same general area was a tank that has um, some tar-like substance around the, the, um, the port on the top of the tank, um, and unknown use. Um, in the past for what that, that tank was utilized for. Um, on, in terms of wildlife seen on the site while uh, conducting the site evaluation, we did see evidence of bobcat. We saw uh, Mississippi kites, red-tailed hawk, red-shouldered hawk, white-eyed vireos, northern cardinals. Um, so a, a mix of species that are, are more common, common species. And of course, the landowners have observed deer and some species of snakes, but they weren't certain what the species were. Um, and uh, the probably other factor to be aware of for this site is um, because it's a mining site, there is some amount of reclamation or remediation that is 
associated with the future of the site. Um, uh, Alachua County Environmental Protection Department staff did meet with DEP to try and gain an understanding of what that might mean, uh, what the remediation or reclamation um, of the site might entail. And it seems that it might be more safety driven um, at this point because of the age of the mining and the fact that there, there weren't wetlands on the site that were impacted by the mining operation. So surface waters that are seen were created by, basically created by the mining operation. So while there is a, um, an important consideration about protecting the aquifer from, surface, from contamination of those surface waters, um, wetland remediation is not a factor for, for the re, um, remediation on the site. It's more about safety from the slopes for potential future owners or users of the site. Um, stability and also the grade on the slopes um, around those um, quarry lakes. So that, that is um, the presentation from the site evalu evaluation. Um, the site did score um, a four out of five for uh, the development review. Um, so it, it, it is perceived to have um, some, some developability despite its rural location, um, primarily because of the unique feature of those, of those quarry lakes and the, um, the appearance of them and um, what they might provide in terms of um, uh, future development potential. So Russ, that, that wraps up uh, the presentation. Thank, thank you, Andy, uh, really very thorough. Very well done. Uh, I'm getting some feedback. Are you getting that too? Oh, no. oh good. sorry. Very, very bad. Good. No, I, I think it's good now. Sounds like I think it cleared up. Okay. Um, as you know, um, I like to go around the uh, the group and uh, individually and uh, for a question, uh, a question, a burning question. From, uh, from each person, and then of course we'll come around and uh, open up the uh, floor to uh, a lot more folks, uh, to everybody essentially, uh, for additional questions. So I'll start the process, and uh, Paul, do you, uh, what question do you have for Andy? Yeah, how many different lakes are there, and what, again, what percentage of the total area is water? Um, okay, so uh, I haven't really counted them. So at the southern end, the, the lakes that you see along the southern end are actually connected by narrow um, channels. So um, you could count them separately, although they, the family does actually vote uh, in a connected manner amongst all of those southern lakes. So I guess if I sequestered them, I might say one, two, three, four on the south side and then there's two distinct ones on the north side. Um, and it's 142 acres um, of surface water and the whole site is 317 acres. So it's a little bit under 50%, it's probably 45%. Does the water level go up and down or is it pretty stable? If the aquifer level is going down, the water level goes down. Um, after Hurricane Irma, the family members that escorted us on site um, definitely reported at the boat ramp, there's a little um, covered picnic area. The top of the building is probably maybe 10 feet high, it might be a little less, that water was within two feet of that, the roof on that. I don't know if that matches what you recall, Linda. But yeah, so the water levels after a major event, if the water's going up everywhere, they, they did report that they go up on that site, but that they also drop if, in general, the area of the aquifer is, is dropping as well. And they don't ever dry up, though? I, I don't know if they ever dry up. I don't think so. Do, the, do those lakes ever fully dry up? No, yeah. Yeah, and, and the, the, the soil that is reprocessed or after the lime rock is removed, is it sand or coarse sand or is it a mixture of lime rock and sand or what is it like to be? There's, 
there's still lime rock mixed in, like lime rock fines basically mixed yeah. in. There is sand, but it's not exactly either. It's, it's I'm not sure. I honestly am not sure what that soil would be classified as. And they don't—they're not really processing them, I and mean, they're hitting lime rock and moving it all off-site. And right. Well, right. The, the the stuff that meets the quality for mm -hmm. um, what they're trying to sell, but there's there are bigger pieces and some smaller finds that remain on-site. I think just because of the difficulty of fully processing the material. But there was originally sand on top of the lime rock yes. that had to be removed and. Yeah, it's probably still there. Those are the hills. Right. That's the overburden. That's actually what makes the footprint of the land, the, what's the, now the uplands on the site, um, is the overburden that was removed to then Get dig to the out lime the lime rock and has kind of shifted around to different places on the site. Looking through the old aerial photos, you can observe that overburden material being shifted around by heavy equipment as the mining operation is seeking the deposits of lime rock in different areas on the site. If that makes sense. So the lime rock has been removed from from below where the soil now is, right? Yes. So the so whole site is is lower than the surrounding area because a portion of that layer cake of of soil substrate, the lime rock portion, is gone. So and some of it's water. So it's yeah, I don't know if I'm explaining that clearly. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we're, we're certainly going to get into a lot more questions uh, after we uh, get through everybody. Uh, Susan. Oh, yeah. Um, did you see any pines? Uh, yes, there were some okay. pines. There are some pines. Yes. Like loblolly? Mostly loblolly. Yeah. I didn't see any long leaf. Um, and I'm, I think some slash, and I think there were a few sand pines in a couple areas as well. Yeah, probably a lot of cedars in there. There's a lot of cedars. A lot of cedars, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Bruce? Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I fail to understand why a piece of land that has been devastated by a family over the years and has the liability of these deep, of these pits with the steep sides to them, and that floods during periods like, like the hurricane, uh, why the county should spend county money on purchasing it. I just don't see it at all. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Brian. The continuing mining activity is just removing those mounds that have already been extracted there's no continual extraction activity going on correct right to my understanding it's not totally clear to me whether the, the pad under each of these two areas where there's a deposit is going to be removed as well and i don't know if you know that linda if it's just the remaining loose piles of lime rock or if they would dig out the the it's not really a pad but the the ground spot that they're piling it on. Okay, but yeah, everything else is is yeah. done. One yeah. thing on the flooding, there was only one time that we had the kind of flooding that he was talking about. It's during the normal hurricanes. I mean, it may rise a little, but nothing, nothing that causes any problems that keeps people from going out there. Right. Only one time. So, and I don't know if everybody could hear that, but but the landowner is clarifying that. Um, it, after Hurricane Irma, which was obviously, as we all know, a very extreme event, that at that time the property level, the water levels on the property came up dramatically, but not typically during other hurricanes or tropical storms. Um, just that was a unique event in the area. Thank you, um, uh, Brian. Um, Brian's not done. Not yet. Uh, oh. Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> definitely unusual. Uh, we don't normally entertain sites like this. Um, it's probably not germane to ask about the status of the landowners to the south and if there's any potential to connect this to the Santa Fe Springs Conservation Area or I don't, I don't see uh, going to the east being viable with I-75 there. 
north, probably to the west to ultimately connect to Santa Fe and Camp Calacua, et cetera. Um, my main concern about the site from an environmental perspective is the potential for contamination of the waters that would obviously directly impact the aquifer and adjacent um, hydrological systems. But I don't know that uh, acquiring this for public access is, is the way to address that concern. Um, I guess I don't really have any other questions. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Yep. Jason? Uh, I'd like to ask two questions. If I could ask Brian a question, why, why he thought active recreation or access would detriment the aquifer? Uh, increased boat traffic and petroleum products being released from those boats. boats uh, I don't know what the level of activity is by this family and their invitees, but um, I have spent some time not in the state of Florida in um, retired quarry lakes, and the kind of activity that goes on there is extensive. That would make the assumption that they would allow boats but if it was purchased. That's a valid point. A valid point. Um, the alternative also would be if this were turned into a 50 or 60 residential home site, all of the uh, contaminants that are typical of residential activity would presumably go straight into this body of water or bodies of water. So, you know, so protecting, protecting water quality is definitely a, on, on the list of things that we're to take into account. I don't know that anything like this was contemplated. Um, the property owners to the south, you mentioned that, but did, did, did you, does the, the property owner know anything about them or any interest? Oh. I, I don't know. Do you, do you, you know? know about what? The, the landowners immediately south of, of your property, do you know anything about one of the common questions is, can you make a corridor from like your property down to a, a protected land further south? Do you know that family to have any interest in conservation of their land? Yeah. So, so the size of a project, the, the larger the project, the more viable it is, especially when it's isolated like this from everything else. Um, I, re I noticed that they are located, I think, in Austria. Um, so, yeah, I'd be curious to know. Um, but that, just in general, that's that, that a lot of value towards this project, towards our, our program. Um, so that's it. I'm done. Thank you, Jason. Amanda. Thanks. I just have um, a comment and then and then a question. So I'm of two minds. I share some of the same concerns uh, as as Bruce. On the other hand, I do think that we've often lamented not having a lot of properties sort of on the further west side of the county. And I think it is, it does have some chance to provide recreation. Um, I agree with Brian's concerns about motorboats, but I think that there are some places where those can be restricted. Um, so I don't know, this is a very unique property and I, I kind of, I kind of love it actually. We don't really have a lot in that in that area compared to you know the eastern part of the county but my question though andy during your presentation you mentioned that you weren't familiar with um, lime rock so just from a management perspective given the fact that this property is so unique to anything that the county's ever bought would it be a difficulty to to manage old an old mine how would would it be harder for you would it cost more what what would that be like for staff um, yeah, that's an excellent question. That would be new territory for our land management staff um, because we, uh, we have, none of us have experience managing a site like this. In all likelihood, I think the site would, if it were to be open to public access, um, it, it 
would be more suited to be managed in a hybrid manner with the county parks department um, and they would probably take the lead on the recreational components um, if that if that were an option I don't know Charlie if you have other thoughts you'd like to share about that um, no I think uh, Andy you've covered it pretty well um, you know obviously there would be uh, restoration costs um, to try to you know as much as possible uh, restore natural communities out there um, make sure that we keep exotics at bay but of course the uh, the biggest management cost would be managing people there, are, there is some use the landowners have reported there there is some use by the neighbors and, and there are um, as one might expect you know it's an attractive site for um, folks to come in and fish um, that are aware of the site um, and to date I think they haven't had any really strong issues in terms of trespass like negative experiences uh, but you know that that would be a component for whomever were to take on management as well the restoration part <laughs> pardon me um, in all likelihood it, it would be it would have a modified restoration target. It, it would not be back to a baseline natural community. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Amanda. Any? Uh, we'll come back, of course, around to everybody. Uh, did Did I miss anybody? Um, not sure if I got everybody or not. Russ, you missed Wes. Wes, thank you, Wesley. All right, my only question is uh, in that map, it looks like the southeastern lakes run all the way up to the border. Do they own that land, or is it that if the county buys it, it then gets you know a million dollar homes thrown on that little bit with a nice preserve behind it for a backdrop, or do they own that border? So the on the south side, with the exception of that little hump that's kind of in the middle left on the south side, um, it, it's almost not cliff, but it is a, a fairly steep sort of wall almost on the property line. Okay. Um, so certainly the, the neighbors to the south could decide they wanted to sell their property or change the use of their property and, and that could provide a backdrop for, for a future development. Okay, but it's a nice steep, it's not a nice, really steep. Right, not that they couldn't grade it, they could always grade it, but it's a, there's obstacles in their way to do that. Well, yeah, down the lake. yeah, I mean, currently, I think the, the um, landowner that toured us on site described um, some folks lowering a canoe in with ropes down the cliff face. Um, so I, I, there's enough of the cliff part on the denominated property that I don't know that it would be easy for a neighboring property to grade it okay. down to the water. I have a question. Thank you. Russ, this is BJ. I'm going to go. Uh, Andy, on that note, all the southern lakes, are they basically, they were reclined with, reclaimed with a very steep embankment. So you, I mean, from a liability standpoint, you can't get in and out of those for the most part, and those are pretty challenging. So um, right in the middle of, uh, below the double red line, in the middle of the highest lake point. That's where the landowners have their boat ramp. Um, that is, it's not steep at all. It's probably, it's, it's a vertical edge, but the, the edge is only a foot out of water. Um, and there are areas like that um, in the interior portion of that um, lake edge where maybe the, the edge of the land is a foot out of water. On the exterior portion of those lake edges, where they're furthest from the center of the property, those appear to be the steeper faces. But realistically, we couldn't get over to those yeah. in our site evaluation. So some of them we could see were quite steep. Some of them we couldn't see well enough to, to have a sense of how steep they were. But, but they're visible rock faces there. Okay. I guess I'll, you know, on that note, I think ecologically and connectivity-wise, it's I don't see it providing much value. There's passive wreck canoeing, that kind of stuff. But I, 
I would probably wouldn't be in support of doing anything with it. I just think there'd be a lot of management issues and challenges. Um, and so that's it. Thank you, Wesley. Is that it? Is that is that everybody? Except for me. Well, I haven't spoken yet, so I'd like to speak. Um, I I think this is a you know you look around the state of Florida and there's other reclaimed mining sites, uh, uh, Hamilton County for one, because that's phosphate, and uh, there's others uh, in Marion County and so on that have made quite unique recreational properties uh, for the public and also from a uh, wildlife perspective. Um, and much like the way we're going to uh, have the uh, School of Forest Fisheries uh, and Geomatics uh, involved with the warehouse purchase, this would be a fabulous one for the uh, uh, the fisheries there at University of Florida to be involved with uh, could really do some interesting work from the standpoint of aquatics, uh, uh, the various species and so on from uh, uh, recreational fishing and so on. Now, obviously, you could probably open this thing up only to kayaks and be a great, a great property from that standpoint. Yes, I am concerned about the uh, you know, it's, it's tapped right into the aquifer, essentially. Uh, you um, have neighboring properties and also from the standpoint of uh, uh, potential development on the property, I, I don't think it could get a lot of uh, high density on the remaining land, but something could happen. Um, uh, I'm sure there's issues there. I've heard that radon levels are typically higher in some mining sites, but I, I don't know if that's the case here. Um, my, I, I like the property. I, I think it would be an interesting asset for the county um, uh, to diversify uh, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, it's, it's open water. We're, we're protecting open water. And uh, we've certainly done that in other situations, yes, in a natural standpoint, but uh, this emulates a lot of uh, natural type conditions. It's not the exact same thing, but it is, it is similar. So I, I like the track. I'm, I'm probably gonna vote in favor of it, but uh, I'm gonna open up the table now for everybody. Uh, feel free to uh, um, ask additional questions. Um, and the, the floor is open. Uh, do you want me to handle that for the Please. in room? Yeah, that would be great, Andy. Thank you. Well, this is sort of a question, I guess, some commentary too. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm really concerned about it taxing the uh, resources of the staff, you know, man you know, management resources. And that sort of thing, um, big unknown here. And then, so the question, I'm trying to get wrap my head around the hydrology here. You mentioned that it's, it sounds like it's a shallow bowl. <laughs> I mean, in terms of the, the land, on the landscape or the land. Yeah, they, when so, you permit these, they have to be internally drained. They can't allow it to pop off or anything. Okay, so I mean, it is all internal drainage, but is it like, I, I mean, I'm thinking like, what if it was developed, would it just, up with water or something in a big storm yeah, it's the Florida aquifer I mean it doesn't little runoff isn't going to change it that much I mean it's more when the Florida rises or, you know that's just coming and going with the landscape you're talking about if homes are there yeah that's surface I mean, water would be a drop in the other bucket. land uses to, to go for. I, I can see some really high-end houses <laughs> yeah <that>? sure <laughs> I can see some really high-end houses yeah I mean there's houses on not on the property, it wants the lake goes off the edge, and there's some dome house sitting there. So it's already uh, obviously some people looking to use it for that purpose. And um, that, that lake that goes off the edge, 
was part of some additional exploratory mining uh, that was done on site. Um, so, uh, but it's, it's not on the landowner's property. Well, my actual question is, does it come with all that stuff that you showed pictures of, the tanks and the, that are all included? My presumption would be that um, if the landowners ended their, their contract with the mining company, the mining company would need to remove all okay. of that human uh, stuff. So all the heavy equipment, the structures, um, the t those tires and the, the, the one tank that's out of use. That would be my presumption. I can switch to any other pictures that folks want to see again if they, if they want to see something. Paul? Was the mine put there because the limestone was close to the top? Uh, was there anything unique about that piece that uh, that made it desirable to mine it? I don't know the answer to that. I, Linda, I don't know if you know. It used to be peanuts. We used to farm peanuts out right there. Yeah. And my dad had somebody came by and wanted to drill to see if there was any lime rock, and he found lime rock all over. So that's when the contract started back in 1957. Mm -hmm. uh, they started mining, and as they didn't mine in some fields, they were still able to use it for farmland and so forth. But as they moved on, whatever. But yeah, they came and drilled and found this lime rock. They came looking for it. But that's true of all of Florida. I just was wondering if it's shallower there, if the lime rock is closer to the top. If they less overburdened, had they be removed or uh, anything? I there. I mean, like you said, they used to be, <coughs> the original mine owners were from 57 to 93, and they went maybe 30 feet, and then other, they were going to, they needed to get out, so this other company took over that guaranteed 50 feet that had bigger equipment, so they went 50 feet down. But, you don't know how much, how much sand they had to remove to get to the top of the line, and then... Um, then there's not any bottom to the line, right? You can just dig until you get tired of well, coming down. Well, the problem was the equipment. No, there's a layer. There's a bottom. What, what's beneath the... Also, getting to it and dealing with the water. I mean, it's beyond a certain depth, it's just hard to mine. So. Yeah, because of the water. I, I, from my understanding, that it's also the quality of the lime rock. Yeah. 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 Quality and texture. It was excellent lime rock in the southern portion, but when they got over to the northern section, that's why they're not doing so well right now, because it's... The lime rock is not as good as it was on the other side. So it's, you know, they're barely out there as mining them now, but they are just enough to keep it going and give us royalties. We had the lower royalties because of that, but so we barely, what we get barely pays taxes or whatever. So that's why we need to get rid of it. It was enough to keep from having to reclaim it too. So right. You know, they, I don't think they wanted to reclaim it themselves. So. <laughs> anyway, they're, it pays our taxes and insurance, and you know that's why we had it put in our contract when we lowered the royalty. They had it in their contract originally that if it ever became unprofitable for them, they could get out of the contract. So in 2015, when they wanted to lower the royalties, we said, okay, we want that same thing, but if it gets to be unprofitable for us, that you need to agree to let us sell it, and they, they put that in the contract. And it's, like I said, we've had it 66 years. I mean, and all our families in High Springs have loved it and enjoyed it, and it's fishing paradise and boating and, you know, things like that. It's not as much now, but um, the other owners live in other states. But there's 17 families involved, and I pretty much manage it with them and everybody. And, you know, we're all getting old because next it's going to be grandchildren taking over. But, it's a wonderful place for recreation. I mean, it's just, just the way it is today. It's just wonderful. It's beautiful out there. If you ever got behind a boat and went out there, it's just amazing. Well, the water's clear. Places like this that I've been to, you know, basically what we've described as more active recreation than sort of na na nature based recreation. Um, they're awesome. I'm not sure if it's exactly appropriate for this program. I'm not sure if there are, if there's funding in the state that would um, be more appropriate, and maybe maybe something that we could partner with on, on a smaller scale and, and a, some other entity push forward with it. I'd like I'd like to be able to go there, but <laughs> just sort of. Um, 
I mean, I, I don't, there's, there's examples in the state of, of reclaimed, lots of them. Alifaya. There's um, a lot of, a lot of, because I've studied all this for years. But there's so many abandoned mines that they've taken and moved golf courses and they restructured. They just done all kinds of personal things with the, the runoff mines. And they put it. a lot of water and it's beautiful. Um, and it's, I mean, like I said, it opens up recreation for people. I mean, that would have to be controlled probably, but bagging, you know, you, you don't have to have a big motor on the right there. Is High Springs, how close is the, is the, the city limits to High Springs? I'm sorry, I didn't how close are the city limits? Uh, Pretty about three miles, three or four miles. Is that new? Is it, is it the, gray, the gray? The gray is the municipal boundary for High Springs, and then the real tight kind of hash marking are the city boundaries for High Springs. So, okay. Yeah. So, so the spider web at High Springs yeah. does go out yeah. toward. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I do agree. It's, it's not. It doesn't seem specifically appropriate for this program, but I, I do like it. So I'd like to see something happen. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I can see. Like, this is an active recreation place. It's going to create sort of this this uh, recurring expense. I mean, it's going to be a like a park, and it'll be, you know, a revenue. It, yeah, yeah, and it'll, it'll be a big thing for this staff. But yeah, I mean, if we let it in the gate or something. I somebody over here. I think so, like if if staff wanted to explore FCT grants or, or things like that that are kind of a little bit non-traditional here. Just you know, something. I don't know if you have any opinion if from a staff standpoint about management of this sort of thing. I can voice my opinion just from a, a staffing level or I can wait for Brian to come on. So I mean it, it would be it would be a different management challenge for our conservation land management staff. Yeah. Because it's it is not the type of site that we typically manage that that I can say for sure. Um, I see it almost be like a Chicago thing where you'd have a vendor of some sort that would manage it and then Staff would manage the, the natural resources portion of it. There's no way you'd want, unless it was bringing a lot of revenue, you would want straight county staff to staff it. Andy, do you, do you think you could get, uh, or Charlie, do you think the uh, uh, forest fisheries and geomatics would be interested in doing something with this property? Mr. Chair, I have no earthly idea, um, but I certainly uh, know the faculty well and uh, can pursue that. That would certainly alleviate uh, some of the management concerns. Uh, Brian? Anybody else? Yeah, Brian, I'm going to talk to Andy Any idea what what is remaining in their share of wild spaces money? The city? Yeah. Yeah. Of High Springs. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it's in the city of High Springs. Yeah, so. I, yeah, I don't know. They even think about looking out here. Is, is there a prohibition on them spending money outside their city limits? I don't know. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, they don't have obviously would be an amenity to them and not to, well, you know. All right. Yeah. All right one question. So, what? from management things, have we ever bought a property and then got a county parks and rec to manage it? Has that ever? Isn't the camp the? the... Yeah. So there, there are examples like, uh, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, Cuscawilla, where. <laughs> Excuse me. That was uh, purchased with Wild Spaces funds, and it is being co-managed by um, uh, Parks and Open Space and um, Land Conservation. It, so, it Excuse me. Uh, uh, if we went forward, I would see some kind of an arrangement like that here. And you, I mean, you would make the recommendation to that director, but they. 
they say no thank you kind of thing. How's that? Well, he like he and I toured the um, the site at the same time. Okay. I mean, anybody that goes out there sees the recreation potential. Yeah. I mean, it's a big project. <laughs> it would take you know a good while to you know to really um, plan this, you know, and get something off the ground, but. There is a lot of recreation potential. It's, it's just, you know, what does I, it do? I think what, excuse me, folks. I, I think what I'm hearing is uh, that we would like uh, the staff to find out more about uh, how it would be done if this property was acquired, uh, other avenues, venues, whatever it might be. To, uh, to assist, I'm getting horrible feedback. I don't know if y'all are hearing it. For whatever reason, I don't know. It sounds like a duck is quacking to me. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Is that better? I, I reduced the volume. Uh, thank you. Oh, that might be work a little bit better. Russ, I think it might be on your end. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, let me see if I can do something here. All right. Is that uh, a little better? Maybe. Have you got any pet ducks? Hmm. Hold on here. Anyway, I'd like to uh, I'd like to see staff come back to us with a report regarding potential uh, of shared management, um, what it would take to actually uh, uh, bring this. If we were to bring this property in, or if we, we, we were to nominate it, we went to the eligibility pool, maybe went to the priority pool, whatever it actually gets was going to possibly come in. What what are we looking at in, in management uh, uh, costs, perhaps, or, or challenges? Uh, uh, some sort of report. Uh, uh, I, I think that's seems what we're, we're trying to wrap ourselves around. Obviously, we have differences uh, in opinion regarding its. Uh, uh, protection aspect, but we're also looking at management pretty hard. And uh, I think it would be good if we could get something from staff on that. So the chair just made a motion. Is he not calling for a motion then? Or, or calling for a motion to put it back in review? Or <laughs> I think he's just asking for staff to give him more information. Is yeah, that right? Is that, yes, I'm just asking for more information. And we, 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 bring this, the we bring this back at our next meeting after staff Mr. has Chair, a chance to. Um, uh, I can certainly go back and, and talk to um, Parks and Open Space. I can talk to uh, the School of Forest Fisheries and Geomatic Sciences. And uh, uh, we can come back, you know, in, in 30 days with a report. That would be excellent, Charlie. Respectfully request you add high <clears throat> and the city of High Springs. Yep. Sounds good. I I, I believe with that, Russ, you're muted. You're muted. Oh, okay, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on here. Oh no. No. Russ, speak please. Can y'all hear us? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. No, no, no. Not the same issue. Charlie, do you, do you, do you see this as even being appropriate? I mean, I'm, I'm we can we can hear Russ on Zoom. Can you hear me? Yes. In the yeah, room. I, I don't know where FCT is at either. Um, I mean, it, this potentially could be an FCT type project. Um, I mean, because they're they are about recreation in addition to natural resource protection and you know, we'd have, need to find a uh, hook into the comp plan. Um, yeah. I mean, and High Springs doesn't seem to be very afraid of annexing with abandon. 
So <laughs> it's not that, not too many parcels to get to the, to this one. Um, anyway. So with that. I hear you, Ross. No. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I think you're going to have to log out and sign back in. That has happened I, to me in the past on, I, on Zoom. So. I'll you try. You can also call in on your cell phone or type on the chat. Okay. Can, wait, can you all hear the rest of us? Can you hear me, Amanda, hear talking? Oh, no, no. All of them. No. So, uh, Bruce, can so you hear them? No, we, don't, we can't hear you, Amanda or Bruce. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I hear Amanda. To, uh, I hear Russ. Read. I'm gonna hang up the phone. It's us, right? I'm gonna log out and log back in. Dang it! No, 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 Russ, you don't do that because this has happened before. It's an issue with the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint interferes with the with the sound. Hold on, baby, just one second. Okay. Can you hear me right now, Amanda? Yes. Okay. Here Can you, you hear me? Well. Yes, Bruce. You're muted, but I hear you. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you're fine. <laughs> yeah. I just sent them a chat saying, okay. While we're waiting, Eleanor, did you, did you want to, did you need something to be? You sure? We're kind of taking a break now because the sound is broken. Do you want to come and give me a hug? Okay, you don't have to, baby. Can you hear us now or can you speak, Russ? Can you hear, I'm speaking, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> can you hear me? This is Russ. Yes. yes. Russ, the ducks are gone. This is great. Okay. All right, so, yeah. Back to you, Russ. You yes. To <laughs> I was, I'm just, what I'm saying is that uh, we will now, I guess we're, we're tabling this property until our next meeting in order to have uh, uh, Charlie uh, ex access more information uh, uh, regarding the management of it, if it was to be acquired. And Russ, I, I understood you said partnerships also? Yes, partnerships would be good too, yes. Okay, we'll pursue it. Thank you. Excellent. In case there happen to be any maps out there, sub subsurface maps, mm -hmm. that would be nice to have as well. I don't know if they exist. Anybody done any mapping of the of the bottom? Like so you can see. To the, see how deep it is. Yeah, the symmetry of your of your pit. Like how deep? How deep? Can how deep? Do you have any other kind of map other than the surface map? Here. Okay. I have topo maps for, for like topography maps with the elevation. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll look into what's out there. Oh, and, and, and the other thing, uh, I, I just just in my in my opinion, um, if you can have any contact with the owners of the south, just to get an idea of what they're. That's always that's all it's always useful. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Um, Has the land not been nominated? No. no. With that, we're moving on to our property evaluations, the, um, or excuse me, desktop evaluation of the uh, Lake Santa Fe KTL Holdings.
does a more brief overview over the property to seek direction from the Land Conservation Board as to whether or not a full evaluation is then done. Um, so this is the KTL Holdings previously um, Krugman Caddy Estate property. Um, it is um, a 211 acre um, property that is five parcels under one ownership. It seems, and the landowner is here with us as well. Um, if there are questions during the desktop, um, Mr. Lascardi. Le uh, yeah. Um, so it seems there are a mobile home pole barn and two sheds on the property. The Alachua County property appraiser just value for the property is $678,157 or $3,202 an acre. And the total value from the Alachua County property appraiser is $708,411 or $3,345 an acre. We do not currently have an asking price for the property. Um, and this is uh, put forth as a fee simple acquisition. The property has been presented to the LCB previously in 2009 as a desktop. So again, not a full evaluation. Um, and the LCB at that time chose not to place the property in the eligibility pool because it had a lack of connectivity. Um, and because of the conditions on site, which were that the property was largely in pasture. Um, it was renominated in 2018. Staff um, determined at that time that conditions had not changed from the 2009 presentation, and therefore it was not brought back to the LCB. Um, and then now in 2021, it has been renominated, and at this time, the adjacent property to the east has been acquired by uh, Latchua County Forever, and that is the Black Lake Preserve or Johnson property. And so just to show you the context here, the red outline is the KTL Holdings property, and that's five parcels. That long center skinny parcel is a rural airstrip. Um, immediately to the east, the green is Black Lake Preserve, and to the north uh, is Lake Santa Fe. Um, and here's, oh, ignore that Bonnet Lake label there and the Lake Santa Fe. I didn't delete those. Um, so <laughs> this is a zoomed in view of the property. You can see the general condition of the property is that it is, um, it's been cleared of uh, the historic natural communities that would have been on site primarily in pasture now with the exception of that rural airstrip that runs down the middle. And I, I guess there has been some sod farming on the site as well, um, or, or is uh, not many, yet. Many, many years ago. Many years and what is now the uh, runway, it's all overgrown. Okay. Uh, this is really not representative. Uh, it hasn't been mowed or uh, actually touched in years. I've owned it for about 10 years, seven, 10 years. And we haven't really done anything. Things are just nature's taking over. Okay. Nature's relentless. That's true. <laughs> you can see the edge of green on the right hand side of the map there. That's the edge of Black Lake Preserve. It is separated by uh, Northeast 222nd Street um, from the property. It's a very, fairly narrow street. And here, just to zoom out to show a little bit more context in terms of the wetlands, um, the site does have, going to the west, um, some flow lines or narrow creeks. And I'll, I'll just kind of hop back and forth so you can see the zoom in. That's the darker footprint that you see on the west side of the property. Um, so some flow lines that do eventually connect to Lock Musa Creek. And on the east, if you look at in the upper right hand corner, Lake Santa Fe, that's the dark blue. Then there's a more medium blue around the edge. That's the footprint of the outstanding Florida waterway around Lake Santa Fe. And you can see it comes right through the corner of Black Lake Preserve, almost to the KTL Holdings property. 
And then there is a essentially a, a drain system, a natural drain system that connects from that point onto the property. So there is a an apparent hydrologic connection there to Lake Santa Fe, and then on the west to Lockloosa Creek. Um, and that is, you know, with the desktop, that's that's about the extent of the presentation. Um, in terms of visuals, I can tell you additionally that um, the site is zoned as rural agriculture. Um, there were six of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation species models for species of interest that overlapped with the property. Um, that was Florida black bear, bobcat, American alligator, indigo snake, osprey, and turkey. Um, None of the site falls within the FEMA 100 or 500 year floodplain. And um, there are four archaeological sites, lithic scatter, within one mile of the property. Um, and so that, that is the desktop presentation for the KTL Holdings property. And I can move back to any of the other images if uh, you would like a closer look at those. Thank, thank you, Andy. Um, in order to move to a full evaluation, that has to be that has to be a motion. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, also, um, Russ, I'll just mention that there, there's at least one hand up in the room. Um, oh. Yeah. Go ahead, one hand. <laughs> okay, Jason. <laughs> uh, the uh, Twilliger. What? The property south of that, so it's, just, it's quite a bit of several parcels that are underneath, I think, the same land holder. I remember the name. So I'm not sure if it was something that's come up before. Um, does anybody know anything about it? Uh, not the same land holder's name. Nope. No. But the all I unified know. together as, as one land. No, I, I, for some reason the name strikes me as something that's come before us before, or that maybe was placed on a project. Um, is it within? Do we have a project? Of it is just outside of um, the South Melrose Flatwoods um, uh, KBN pro project, and it, it's also just outside of the current Lake Santa Fe project. Okay, it's but not December, so I wasn't sure. What? Yeah. I just, uh, Would nominations show up on this? After any former in a, evaluation? In a full uh, evaluation, yeah. Oh, in a full, you would bring that data. Right, in. we would do basically like we, what we've done for yeah. the well, The name sounds familiar too, so it may have been another site somewhere else in the county, but it's pretty big. Anyway. I'm just going to open up the floor to the, uh, to the group there. Um, and uh, especially the, uh, the, the, the group participating live. <laughs> uh, if uh, you have uh, some, some further questions, go right ahead. We heard from you, Jason. Paul, Susan, Brian. Does anyone, Paul, comment? Okay. Now I'm just trying to get a better idea of exactly where we are looking at here. What? So Melrose is to the east on on 26. Melrose um, east. Yeah. So County off boundary is just off right of that. Right off Russ's head. Oh. Right. Yeah. To the green at the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's the black. Where the big fence is. The okay. big fence. Yes. Yeah. The, west, the west road. side of this property is the road that runs up to Earlton. Oh, the west side. Little Lake Santa Fe. Oh, yeah. Up to the west. Okay. The blinking light at 1469 and State Road 26 yeah. is the corner. That would be the southwest corner of the property. Yes. Okay. And Earlton is up to the north there. Correct. Right. Yep. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Is it the right. inconvenience store in the vicinity of this? Oh, uh, no. There's an old, old abandoned. Store of some kind. Yeah, there is an old feed store that feed was store. recently uh, purchased. Uh, Great House Butterfly place was in yeah. the south. Yeah, across the street is the 
butterfly farm. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. I, I'm can, got a picture of where it is now. Okay. Any questions? Anyone? Russ, do you want me to? Yeah, live group, go ahead. If there's somebody you got got a question, just go for it. No questions, Russ, back to you. Thank you. Zoom crowd? No? Do we have a, a, a motion to uh, uh, pursue this property further, to uh, go for a full evaluation? I'd like to just ask staff what your feelings are. Do you, do you want to do a full evaluation on this? Is this compelling from your perspective? Mr. Chair, um, I think staff is is um, neutral on on this. Um, you know, it's been um, viewed by the LCB in the past. Um, the only thing that has changed is that uh, the county now owns the property across um, a paved road. Um, as Andy uh, pointed out, it is outside of any existing project areas. Um, so we really don't have a strong basis for making a recommendation here. None of the current staff has been on the property. Well, hearing no motion for the property, the, uh, uh, then essentially this dies, um, as, as I see it. And, uh, uh, we can, if it comes back to us, I guess we'll look at it again. But uh, it uh, receives no motion to move forward. So um, we'll uh, leave it at that. Thank you. Yes. Do we have old business? I'm not aware of any. Thank you for your Thank time. You for Thank coming. you. Thanks for coming. Okay. Then uh, new business. New business. Acquisition updates. Uh, no. no. New business. New business. Sorry. I, sorry. I have. I have some. We have some new business. Oh. <laughs> New business, that's right. Yes. I remember. Yes. I'm just saying if you were awake, Amanda. Yes, I'm here. Um, so um, I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody. I'm starting to get feedback now too. Um, Russ, do you think maybe you can mute yourself? I, want, I think it might be coming from your... Okay. Oh, or maybe the ducks are everywhere. I don't know. In any case, um, I have just been uh, elected as faculty Senate chair elect at the university, um, which is a pretty, a pretty large job and I'll be working, you know, in central administration and I'll be on the board of trustees, um, working with the board of governors, working with deans across the university um, on behalf of the faculty. Um, because it's such a big job, I trying to step back from as many other activities as I possibly can. And that kind of includes this. So um, it's been a real pleasure and honor. And I've really learned so much serving on the board and from, from each of you. So thank you for welcoming me. And I look forward to continue to see what um, all, all the things that you all accomplish. So thank you very much for my time here. Thank you, Amanda. 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 That's a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Even though you're hearing me through feedback, probably. Thank you. Uh, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for all your comments, like very, really, very really keen comments, uh, and participating in, in uh, I believe, all of our meetings. Uh, it was certainly uh, uh, enjoyable having you on the committee, and we look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you in the near future. Yes, and I'll be taking my keen comments to the provost, the president, and the board of trustees, so I know they will all enjoy that. 
<laughs> Thank you so Amanda, much. From, from the staff and liaison level, I think we would also like to just express our appreciation for your, your contributions to the ACS program and specifically to the Land Conservation Board. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Um, from our side as well to have you on the board. Thank you. I loved working with the staff and I just wish that I could be there in person to, to say goodbye, but perhaps I'll come by for a visit once once our dystopia has gone back to just a, a regular topia. <laughs> if you have nothing to do on a Thursday evening, you can certainly tune in every third Thursday. There we go. Thank you it so much, like, Amanda. Thank you. And, and Russ, it looks like Bruce may have something to say. Yes. Bruce? Yes. Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to thank Amanda for her being here on the committee and uh, the work she's done. And I f feel very excited for you for your new position. I think that sounds like a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. And I'm excited I, too. I know. I know very well the feeling that uh, you can get stretched too thin, and. So you're wise to, to pull in a few things, but we'll, we'll miss you, but have a good future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, with that, we have a vice chair position that is open. And uh, we would love to get it filled. We'd love to have it filled this evening. So uh, sorry, just a procedural question. Um, Andy, am I now officially resigned so I can't vote for the vice chair? Am I like off the board? So I'm just sort of watching the rest of the proceedings here? I think so. Yeah, that, okay. that's my understanding. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because I didn't want to accidentally vote when I shouldn't. So I will not vote. I'm just going to watch from here on out. That affect the quorum? No, it does not. Affect <laughs> <I'm just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Andy, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this this can be a volunteer that steps forward for the position. Is that correct? That's correct. Or, or gets nominated. Or could be a staff member. Yeah. 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 Or it could be a nomination as well. Or you could be a nomination. Anything. you're not writing anything. <laughs> it's all up here. Like me. Oh, you are. Okay. Never mind. Never mind. Well, we're, we're I, don't, I don't see you currently employed. <laughs> Somebody's not here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let me ask the question, Brian. Do you want it? Since you're 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 like in the food chain. No, thank you. Okay. Susan, do you want it? We no, thank you. I, I can't do the chair. I can't slide into that. No. BJ. No, thank you. <laughs> um. Okay. Then let's, any. Uh, I don't want it. I don't. BJ and I. Oh, I've already done it. <laughs> um, no, I think it's beyond my capability. What is what is vice chair? Bruce, yeah. no, is he, is he you want to be you want to be vice chair? Please. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm uh, very tied up right now with with friends of Cusco Willa, which is is more than I intended to with all the other things. So I I really can't. But thank you very much. Okay, so we got three people we can choose from. And Paul, I uh, know. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to nominate Ed. Oh, he's not here. <laughs> Even better. I think I think you can. I think it's happened before, actually. <laughs> That's one of the penalties. Is of not coming. <laughs> it always is, isn't it? Mr. Chair, I, I think we could probably put this vote off for a month. Yep. Very good. And, and make sure that the information gets out and everybody's got a chance to 
who might want to to step up. Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be good. Some folks could probably sleep on it. You never know. We may have uh, uh, everybody wanting to be vice chair. So that, that's a uh, very prudent, prudent call, Charlie. Thank you very much. When would be the next opportunity to get more OCP yeah. members so appointed? Does that create a slot? It, it creates a spot that could be filled by a new member or it could be filled by an alternate member that applies to, to a full member position, um, which would vacate the alternate member position to be filled. So there's, it, it could, there's a couple ways it could get filled. The intent would be that we would get it posted as an open position next week. Um, and it will have to be approved by the board. So we'll have to go to, wow. once we receive applications, we will have to go to one of the Board of County Commissioners meetings coming up. So unlikely to happen by next month. Right. So, so gosh, I'm sorry for causing all of this trouble, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it, happens, it happens all the time. Typically, the, the alternate always gets picked. I don't remember if they, okay. they want it. <laughs> Then you gotta get another alternate like the yeah. following month. Back can we get another up. alternate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know, and they may be able to choose an alternate on the spot if they pull okay. Yeah, they they if, if there are sufficient candidates. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well that takes care right. of that takes care of that. Yes, thank you, uh, Andy. Okay. Staff updates that acquisitions. Yes, and if it's okay, I'm going to remove my mask so I can speak more freely. <laughs> um, the big news, and hopefully you all have been seeing this in various forms of media because it's been getting a fair amount of attention, we've actually uh, closed on two donations um, in the, about the last month. Uh, the first was the um, warning donation down in Watermelon Pond. Um, I'm got just a couple of uh, slides to show you the maps in a, in a second. Um, beautiful 80-acre property that fits right into existing public ownership and a conservation easement held by the, the county. So uh, wonderful donation uh, by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Warney. Um, the deed was signed on, on March 12th um, and was recorded on, on May 7th. Um, there were complications with each of these um, donations, which I can get into if there, there are questions, uh, but both of them end up being fairly complicated little little transactions. Uh, the second one, uh, the Lundgren donation, you all have been hearing about that for some time. Um, that took a long time to, to come together because, again, it was a very complex um, uh, deal there. Uh, basically, uh, the Lundgrens conveyed a, a conservation easement to Latcher Conservation Trust and Conservation Florida uh, before it was then um, deeded to the, the county. And there were a number of um, easements and licenses and what have you that had to be traded back and forth to make the whole, the whole deal work. So as, as you see, uh, the deed was actually signed May 12th and it was supposed to be recorded today, as a matter of fact. As you go forward, I'll, I'll just step through these maps real, real quickly. Um, the red you see on the center of the map is the um, Warney donation, 80 acres. Uh, it, it joins um, existing county ownership to the south. Then there's the uh, Ashton Preserve Conservation Easement in between, and the um, county's Ferran property is there. So this makes a really nice um, assemblage of properties that protect some uh, sand hill, some, um, some uh, wet prairies, uh, and some oak hammock, as you see on the next map here. There you go. Uh, so the, the south end, there's some, um, some oak hammock, then it goes into sand hill. As you go to the north, you get the, you've got the wet prairie area, and then uh, some um, oak hammock on the, on the north end. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Warney, I guess um, Mr. Warney in particular was into uh, reptiles and amphibians, mm -hmm. and um, um, so he managed it with, with that intent. There, are, you know, little structures out there to um, provide them places to hide where you know they could be studied and what have you. So it's it's just beautifully set up for us to take over management. It's in great condition. 
Any, any questions about this one? Can we get on? Um, so <laughs> the um, access to this property is on a private road uh, that uh, serves a number of, of uh, private landowners in there. That was frankly one of the, the details that we had to, had to work through on this thing. Um, so it's not available to the general public. Um, staff will set up, you know, tours on the property as, as appropriate, like we do some of our other properties. Okay, the Lundgren donation, um, 236 acres on the uh, Santa Fe, Upper Santa Fe River. You see the proximity to the um, Northeast Flatwoods uh, Preserve. It's got almost a, a mile of uh, river frontage, about five miles uh, northwest of Waldo. Next. And um, here you see the property that you'll see the cross hatched area. That is a parcel that um, the Lundgrens are retaining. Uh, they have um, a house on there that they, they use as a winter home. And um, they will hold a life estate, and after um, their passing, the property will pass to a Latcher Conservation Trust. Um, so they'll have the opportunity for, you know, a, a caretaker residence or a, a nature center or whatever on that, uh, that area. The property that <clears throat> the county has received is in uh, red, and you see moccasin uh, branch that runs up uh, through the property and added um, benefit of this, and a lot of this is, is kind of a sand hill community and some, some flatwoods, and of course beautiful, um, you know, kind of floodplain forest along the uh, Santa Fe River. Is yes. Uh, well, I don't know about right now. Okay. I mean, it's pretty dry out there. There are a lot of things that aren't flowing right now, but last time I was on it, it was, it was definitely flowing. Did Dale ever finish his extensive trail network in there? Or? <laughs> um, yeah, I think he's completed his, his trails, um, you know, while they're still on the on the property, um, you know, in conjunction with a Latua Conservation Trust, um, landowner would still have some access to the property, that type of thing, uh, which I, I think is appropriate in this case. So, Susan? yeah, um, are y'all going to be able to burn and stuff out there? We are likely not going to be able okay. to burn out here. All right. Yeah, that's okay. At least in the at least in the short term. Yeah. And why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that um, the donor is uh, concerned about the use of fire out here. And so. if he's out there for the life of state. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, but even as as it is, I, I think um, ecologically, from a habitat perspective, is is still a great. There's some, I mean, great can you use mother, there's some gophers and stuff, right? Maybe you can yeah. Some other treatments. And just to remind you all, uh, the property just to the uh, the west, um, yeah, Andy's got the cursor on it now. That's uh, that's a property that we're negotiating on a on a conservation easement. We basically have a handshake deal. We're just waiting for for some details to be cleared up before we can um, put a contract together on that one. They had this on the radio on Monday. I did not hear that, but I I heard it was on. Um, okay, good quote from him. Um, here's the acquisition update. Um, you know, typically we are working on, you know, 18, 20 or so projects at any one time. Um, just a couple I will, I will highlight uh, there. The uh, Hitchcock Ranch Conservation Easement. Um, we recently went back to the, the Board of County Commission and requested authorization to add another 200 acres that was recently acquired by the uh, Hitchcocks uh, into that, um, that deal. And unfortunately, um, asking for authority to uh, continue pursuing the deal without NRCS as a partner. Um, we had gotten pretty far along with NRCS, but, but um, frankly, for a couple of reasons, uh, that wasn't working out. And so um, the Hitchcocks have uh, committed that, that they will do uh, a bargain sale at at some level on this on this deal, which um, I think was enough to um, get the board to feel comfortable with us moving forward on that. So we are in the middle of, of getting the appraisals on that that 200 acre addition. This was like the working farm. Yes, it's yeah right. 
Um, it's some people know it as Santa Fe River Ranch. Uh, there's a you know event venue, a couple of event venues on the on the property. Most of it is in um, uh, pasture, some cattle production, kind of low level of ca cattle production. Uh, but there are a number of streams and cars features and what have you on this property, and, so and it connects our Mill Creek Preserve with public lands on the Santa Fe. So are we? So, are you? Uh, will you be having cold feet to work with NRCS in the future based on what happened with this? I mean, no. I details, no. Just, no. Uh, you know. Okay. Um, frankly, it got down to some of the details. You know, between NRCS and the landowner. Um, yeah. Certainly, we have a good relationship with NRCS. And, and we'll continue to look for opportunities there. Um, the other one I wanted to um, uh, to mention the uh, Santa Fe Lake Jefferson property, which is uh, kind of within our Lake Alto Preserve. Uh, that one we're getting very very close to a, a contract on that. There are just a couple of little little things to tweak, and then we'll we'll be uh, looking at putting an option together on that. And then um, the Mill Creek Rembert. Uh, property, we're uh, really starting to seriously get into that. Um, we're working on the draft of the conservation easement. That will be the precursor to us going to a uh, um, an appraisal on that. And the um, we had put in for a million dollars in matching uh, money from the uh, Swanee River Water Management District uh, through uh, the State Springs funding uh, that got through the district. Um, it's recommended by them, and it's now nice. sitting with uh, with DEP to get their final approval. So it was recommended by the by the governing board. Yes. Oh wow. Yes, Great. absolutely. Great. So yeah. How often has that happened lately? Well, they've been, they've been opening it up a little more. Yeah, I mean they've got the they've got the springs funding, and um, I think there were maybe a couple of land acquisition uh, projects that they looked at. Most of them were were cost shares on, uh, you know. Um, Water conservation or nutrient reduction type um, projects, um, but yeah, uh, conceptually, you know, they've approved us for up to a 50% match on that. Nice. That's terrific. Great. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Mr. Chair, that's my report. Unless there are any questions. Any any questions for Charlie? Please. All good news. Thank you, uh, Charlie. That was uh, a very concise, uh, concise report. We appreciate it. Let's move on to the uh, stewardship updates. Andy, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's been a while since you have heard a stewardship update from us. 2019, um, 2020, they they were silenced by COVID. So um, we're going to just jump into it. And for those that have not um, enjoyed a stewardship update that are newer to the board, it's, it is where staff provides an overview on land management practices ongoing on the ACF preserves um, and sort of general updates, notes of interest. Um, so it's not everything, but it's a, it's a brief overview over the stewardship activities on the preserves. Um, we do often start out with a land acquisition um, slide, and then this is provided by Kevin. Um, of course, the highlight of uh, our, our weeks, the last couple of weeks, have been the closing on the Lundgren property, and that is Mr. Lundgren in the lower left, um, and uh, the Warney property, and that is uh, a Gopher Tortoise Burrow uh, in, the, in the lower right. Um, and you can note that during the, the period of our current land acquisition cycle, um, beginning in 2018 with the White's property, um, Four Creeks Preserve now, um, we, our land acquisition team has been very successfully adding conservation lands to our um, portfolio. And now um, we are sitting at um, 24,782 acres um, conservation land acquired. Um, so obviously that's increasing the opportunities and challenges for the various stewardship activities on these lands. Um, Could you go back one quick? Yes. Um, just, just a question. Yeah, the, the bar graph is interesting. Anyway. Anything? No, it, just, it looks awesome. Oh. But, it, but I think if you put it, if you put the scale from zero to twenty-five, yeah, yeah, right. The scale is nineteen. Like, wow, we're ripping off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
that's a classic trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do they say? Lies, damn lies, and statistics. And <laughs> yeah, that was, that's it. This is the words we live by, yes. Um, so first, starting with the prescribed fire um, update, um, just a quick sum of the 2020 numbers. Um, uh, we, we did pre-COVID and even during the shutdown of COVID, managed to execute um, some, some of our planned prescribed burns, uh, totaling 1,000 acres on the different preserves, as well as um, 100 and some acres of fuel reduction mowing and um, fire line prep uh, and the various other activities that we do to prepare for burning. Um, in 2021, of our 1,600 acre goal for prescribed burning, currently we're almost at 1,300 acres. Um, that's part of the way through the third quarter. That's the quarter we're in right now. Um, and of course, the, the recent stop in the rainfall uh, has shut us down temporarily on that, but we do have several growing season burns planned and are looking forward to executing those. Um, we have actually done some fuel reduction mowing uh, in quarter three. It didn't make it into this slide, but um, we've done approximately 70 acres. And, and what that is, is taking in a, a small skid steer, so a small piece of heavy equipment that's a tracked piece of equipment to um, mulch or mow um, areas that have had, that are in fire-type fire habitat, but from which fire has been excluded for perhaps decades, and therefore the underbrush has grown up so excessively that the only type of fire that we would be able to reintroduce would be a catastrophic fire. Um, so to allow us to do a more managed fire um, restoration, uh, we, we do mow those fuels down in, in certain areas where that's most necessary. And it's like, Jason. And mow is an interesting term, right? Because you're mowing like trees. Shrubs. Shrubs yeah, yeah trees, trees. Trees um, up like to three inches three in inches, diameter. Yeah, yeah um, and, and shrubs. Yeah. That is a good, fuel reduction is a, mowing is a good tool. I, I use it personally on my own land, and it's, it's very, very handy on places. It, it is. It can be critical for, for restoring along unmanaged sites, especially. And so you, um, you can see, um, if you look at the graph in the lower right, that it's, that's 2010 to present, 2020. Um, our prescribed fire program has obviously grown over time, but also fluctuates with weather and various conditions. Right now, I think we're all feeling very excited to have all of the new staff we've gained um, in, in transitions and personnel that have happened since 2018 to have a very good team right now. And our burn implementation has become even more efficient and effective um, as each of those team members has gained skill and experience. It's an exciting time for us in that regard. Um, Invasive species management, I'm sure Emily will love that I have this picture of her up here, but um, uh, as many of you are aware, many of the properties we acquire have um, existing and often very uh, widespread non-native invasive plant populations on site. And part of our goal for our program is to survey and treat 25% uh, of our preserve acreage every year. Um, and that, that can add up as we're at 25,000 acres. That's a lot of boots on the ground, surveying and then applying, typically applying herbicide to the non-native invasive plants we encounter. Um, for fiscal year 2021, um, so far to date, we've surveyed a bit over 2,000 acres of our preserves and have either treated or verified to be free of non-native invasive plants, 1,700 acres. Um, in this fiscal year, we've been fortunate to get two different grants from the Florida Fish, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission for treatments on some of our most densely infested preserves, um, Tuscaloosa head, Headwaters, formerly known as Franklin Crates Preserve, and um, the Wakahuda Preserve. And uh, in addition to that, we are still tackling pasture grass treatment as part of our sand cell restoration in some sites. The images at the bottom are dense coral ardesia and then dense coral ardesia after treatment. Go ahead, Jason. Um, when you when you acquire a piece of property, and I should know this, uh, do you do you do an assessment to get a, like a, a an acreage estimate? 
as a part of the evaluation, obviously we're, we're documenting what we see in our, in our visit during the site evaluation um, pre-acquisition. And then after acquisition, um, obviously each, each subsequent visit we gain more knowledge. And when we get the sense of, you know, where the property sits, if it's generally clean or generally very infested, um, that will dictate how much time and what, what treatment of approach, whether it's seeking grant funds or contracting or, or using staff in-house. But, but um, you typically don't have an estimate for like, don't just in general. I mean, I know it's like, typical because like an, an individual tree is, what do you call that? Like, you know, or something. But um, Yeah, I don't have a good <clears throat> map in this presentation to show you, but we do uh, end up doing transects through the sites and recording densities of overall plant cover to okay. generate like polygons of invasive plant density and we utilize that to determine what our most efficient management approach is. Yeah. Paul? Uh, invasive plants are sort of like wildfires. If you get in there when there's only one little tiny spark, you can put it out at low cost. If you wait, it caused a pile. Yes. So I was wondering if you should prioritize the, the properties in terms of invasive control to get the ones when they're just starting. Very, very insightful, Paul. Um, yeah, I've, I've watched Kogan grass and other things spread like wildfires once they get a, a hold. Yeah, and we do, we, that is how we approach our program, um, especially for our in-house staff time, because the staff can be multitasking while they're, while they're surveying for those more scattered infestations surveying and treating, they can be accomplishing other management goals simultaneously. And we tend to focus our contract dollars or grant efforts on the major dense infestations because they're more suitable to that type of workforce doing the treatment. Um, but yeah, you're right. I think the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council used to describe it as nascent foci. So the, the focal areas outside the center are the ones that are the most important ones to to hit and you work your way towards the, the heart of the infestation last. Um, so yeah, get the fingers first. Also, like uh, citizen volunteers, are they ever used to do anything? It, over the course of our program in, at different levels, we have utilized um, volunteers for mostly hand removing, um, doing invasive plant poles, and of course, the city of Gainesville and other conservation partners in the area do that as well on their properties. Um, there, there are sites that are, are better for that and sites that are less, less ideal for volunteers, but we certainly do utilize them and are, would gladly utilize more volunteers in that regard. Air potato roundups. Yeah, that's a classic example of a very successful volunteer. But I thought the beetle got hurt. It has reduced it dramatically. Yeah. It's not completely removed it. It's gone out of my Andy, really Andy, yes. Is is that a typical acreage to date, or uh, do you expect that next year? Um, yes. So notice that the second row is treated or free from invasives. So our goal, and this is an internal county performance tracking goal, is that we are either sur <coughs> excuse me, surveying or surveying and treating 25% of the total preserved acreage each year. Um, and and there, this is approximately an average um, point for us in terms of acreage mid quarter three, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, silviculture. Um, we, our timber inventory um, is actually completed, so we, we actually have achieved our 992-acre goal, and that's regular revisiting of the um, pine forested stands um, on the county preserves to verify the health of the stands and the growth rates and whether or not the stocking density is too high or, or too low, um, essentially. Um, we do have the bar hammock timber sale that we had previously bid out in 
2019 that are unfortunately our logger um, defaulted on and it did not get harvested so we are in the process of rebidding that sale right now and that's that 311 acre pending sale um, and for that sale we, we did have to remark some of the timber that's the 79 acres that you see there in quarter one um, at this point this year no no other sales um, or sites that are requiring reforestation um, though we did have several planted from fiscal year 20 um, and you'll note the comment at the bottom for the plantings at Balu Forest, Lake Alto Preserve and Pfeiffer Flatwood Preserve we averaged um, survival uh, seedling survival at 500 trees or seedlings surviving per acre which is about 85 percent of what was planted per acre um, and that's uh, that's very we're very pleased with that survival uh, percentage so what about parcel B where the county's in parcel the, e? the uh, new one we just acquired yeah B tree creek to preserve no thinning there or the management I know is different with that's Adam. different yeah, yeah so could, yeah. Um, in that deal Warehouser retained the timber rights right. for up to yeah, 10 yeah, years gotcha. and so they will be harvesting they are harvesting timber out there and we will have um, a significant cost for reforestation going forward on that and then I think I forgot does so does the funds from a harvest go to the general fund or does ACF get to keep no it, it stays with the specific preserve from where the timber was cut thank you <clears throat> Other How do you choose what type of pine to plant? At, I think on a, a broad sweep, we are going to choose longleaf pine if it is the appropriate pine for the site. Um, and it, it's based on soil type, natural community type on site. And um, I think going forward, depending on the properties we acquire, you know, if we're looking at planting in, in, in improved or semi-improved pastures, um, it, it may be somewhat dependent on competition or the, the site preparation treatments we're able to do if there are somehow restrictions on given sites. But in general, we try and pick the right one for the soil type and the hydrology of the site with a preference towards longleaf pine on the sites where it's appropriate.
uh, hosting the UF avian biology class on a field trip to see the burrowing owls at Watermelon Pond Preserve. And uh, that was able to be done under UF's COVID requirements for students. And so we did that even a little earlier than other events because they have very strict requirements for students participating in class events. Um, and then we've additionally initiated removal of the solid waste at Wakahuda Preserve, which is just years of household trash on this particular property. Um, and we've hosted just in the last, since April, the Great American Cleanup, um, sent volunteers there, and that was through Keep Alachua County Beautiful's organization for volunteer events. And then the UF Gator Alumni International Service Day just occurred in May, and we were able to get one of their groups out at Wakahuda as well. And we've come close to um, filling a fairly large dumpster um, with all sorts of random trash and old tires. Any, um, any new stuff? Like, are you seeing any new, like, encroachment? Oh, okay, good. It's, it's historic. Um, so, uh, and then obviously we have ongoing still throughout the pandemic um, site monitor volunteers, those are the folks that go out to the county preserves that have open trails and walk the trails and trim branches and report conditions if it's a tree down or, you know, some problem on the site. Um, we still have volunteers contributing in that way as well. In terms of site development, I think you all know that Turkey Creek Preserve opened March 1st. That's five miles of trails, including a fitness station. 21 parking spaces in the trailhead, the main trailhead, which is being filled many weekends. Now that it's blazing hot, that might reduce. <laughs> um, and um, we have moved forward with uh, the design for the uh, boardwalk access and access trail on site. Um, and staff are working on drafting the project specs for that to finish the infrastructure that's planned for Turkey Creek Preserve. The Sweetwater Preserve West Access Point, which is that dead end street, um, 16th Street, um, is moving forward. The EPD Water Resources Department has taken a, um, a, an excellent challenge on in designing um, a combination stormwater and trailhead retrofit there, which will actually include parking spaces there, so people aren't just parking on this dead end road with semi trucks, um, also parked there, and um, will be part of the tie-in of the trail system that the city of Gainesville has planned, connecting downtown with Sweetwater Wetland Park. Um, the design work and engineering has been done. The bid period closed on May 20th. Mm -hmm. EPD wow. also water resources received on a $185,000 grant from DEP to help defray the cost. And we could have construction work going as soon as early July there, which will be a real um, uh, improvement and wonderful amenity for the citizens both to access Sweetwater Preserve, but to serve as a tie-in for that trail system that's planned as well. Is the trail system going to go just, just straight across, like basically a little bit to the, to the north, I guess, on the other side of the power line? Even. Off the power line. Right along Williston yeah. Road. Yeah. The GRU line, yeah. Okay, so a little bit further up. Uh, well, it crosses that road. It crosses the dead end of 16th. I was just curious. I think it's called the Bishop property that's in the... Yes. It's like uh, basically wet, I think. Yes, yeah, it's managed by Kings Prairie. Is that yeah. who? Okay. Yeah. I didn't realize that. If we're talking about the same Bishop property. It's in between the, the, the easement and yes. and the whatever, 16th? Or, yeah, 16th yes. Okay. And, and this is a terrible vision of what that engineering drawing looks like. Mm -hmm. So I know it's too small to look at. Free rebar. Yes. Um, Buck Bay Preserve is the next preserve slated to be open to the public in 2022. And staff are working on um, improving the roads, installing fire breaks, designing the trailhead, pursuing permitting from the Water Management District for trailhead installation. And um, additionally, this will include opening of the Radiant Tract, which is one of the recent acquisitions. That was the acquisition that added to Buck Bay Flatwoods Preserve. Um, so that will get that acquisition opened as well. And Please, then- I've got a question regarding Buck Bay. Will, will that be yeah. burning? Are you gonna be doing burning on that track? Oh, we have yeah. been. 
Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> where where is the trailhead? Where would the trailhead be at? Off of um uh. Whatever, yeah, whatever. The, the, the road that goes up to um, road. yeah, the Gator National. Okay. Yeah. And then this is just a note on a, a fairly large site improvement project that we were able to execute at the end of 2020 with our partners from NRCS um, because Bar Hammock Preserve, the Levy Prairie part, falls within an NRCS Wetland Reserve Program easement. Um, they have been able to assist us with funding. Basically, they hired the Army Corps of Engineers to come out and remove the endless number of dead and dying trees on the levee around Levy Prairie, um, which basically every week and almost every day, trees are falling on that levee because there are hundreds of these dying trees growing in this levee. Um, and it's been a huge issue for staff and site safety for public visitors utilizing that levy because that's the, the public loop around Levy Prairie. So um, we had a couple months of some very heavy mulching equipment working through and you can see uh, the before and after image at the bottom is just one small section. That's the levy spur that goes to the other new acquisition from this funding cycle, the Wolfsheimer acquisition at Bar Hammock, um, which that levy had become largely impassable to equipment and staff for management. So it has been reclaimed. And additionally, the south part of the and east part of the public levy has been um, opened up and, and improved for safety and, and maintenance of the integrity of the levy as well. And that's around $400,000 of work that NRCS funded um, for us. And that is the end of the stewardship update. Quick question on that. Yes. I was out there this past weekend and uh, somebody asked, hey, it would be nice if they could connect these two properties. And I said, well, there was talk about that. What is the status of bridging the, the it, canal between north and south? So uh, that is a project that's still on the long-term to-do list, but because there are trailheads to both properties and both sites are accessible, it is um, it's not at the top of the to-do list in terms of infrastructure. Yes, Paul. Does anybody know what that major power line construction is across Paines Prairie along 441? And it goes, it cuts, at, once it gets to the south side, it cuts at an angle and goes across the Wakahoota Road. What, what are they moving power from to? Where, what, who's doing that and what's that all about? So presently that would be Duke Energy. Um, and they, uh, they've been wanting to replace those poles for quite a while, um, just knowing from when I worked at Paints Prairie. Um, I'm, I'm sure they've just finally gotten to the point of doing that. Dry enough. Yeah, dry <laughs> enough, and there's concerns about the integrity of those poles, so um, they've been intending to replace those. And I, how far that line goes in terms of power transmission, I'm not actually sure, but it's a very large um, transmission. It looks line. like there's new new uh, poles going where there weren't any before. That is, uh, new tracks have been cleared up to. <coughs> Um, well, I think the line always made that turn at the south end of the prairie basin, if that's where you're thinking of. I mean, obviously the footprint of the equipment makes it look like a new, big new track. But are you thinking of where it turns? Well, I'm thinking of both on the north side of the prairie and on the south side of the prairie, there's huge new poles going up and new swaths of woods have been cleared along the Wakahoota Road there. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that, that line did always... We can talk about it probably another time. Yeah. <laughs> I wondered why the newspaper yeah. never says anything no. about it. It's like a major, major, major thing happening there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, uh, good. Was that Charlie? Did you say something? Yes, sir. I've got yes. uh, one additional quick update before we Thank leave you. this item. Go ahead. Okay. Um, as you all are aware, um, Sandy Vardaman retired at the end of February, and Andy has been uh, in that position in an acting capacity since that time. I am very pleased, thrilled in fact, to announce that um, Andy has been named 
permanently to that position of uh, environmental program supervisor. Yay. Excellent. Excellent. We're all very thrilled, and so we'll be we'll be recruiting a new senior environmental specialist here soon. Congratulations. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I think we're to other business at this point. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Uh, sorry, um, we're, we're at other business. Yes, now. other business. Yes, thank you. Is there any? Is there any? <laughs> Meeting date. The next meeting date. Yes. The next That's meeting it. Date. Okay. Yes. Oh, before you, uh, would you, would you update us on uh, briefly on what the requirements are going to be that you know of right now from the county on our meetings, whether they're hybrid, uh, or will we participate fully at the next time? Have you heard anything more? Uh, on that? We, we have not received any additional guidance beyond what we were given mid-April. And in mid-April, um, there was a resolution issued that was, is basically Board of County Commissioner's policy that does authorize the ongoing um, utilization of the hybrid meeting approach. Um, obviously, that board policy could be superseded by a subsequent board policy, but at present, and we could get maybe some insight on whether there's some contemplation of changing that. Um, at present, we have not heard any indication of a change to the opportunity for hybrid meetings. So hi as far as we know, that is going to continue to be an option. Thank you, Andy. Uh, appreciate that. Um, with that, our next meeting is scheduled for June 24th. Um, I think that's our standard uh, time period, third week in the month for a Thursday uh, evening. Uh, do we have any significant issues with that date? If if none, we will we will lock that date down as our as the uh, next meeting date. And uh, uh, do we have any uh, comments from the public? If the public is still uh, with I, us, I have a quick question before we go on public yes. comment. Um, oh, man, go ahead, uh, Jason. Quick, come on, quick. He's, he's no, trying. No, no he's trying to rush. <laughs> we, come back to it. we would love for you to be vice president. <laughs> no. uh, I think we have we, we do have public comment. comment. We do have public one, second one, very quickly. I'm Mary Helen Wheeler Citizen. Um, this is an amazing board. You guys have the best board ever. This, you get to see something that's coming right down the pipe, which is exciting. It's interesting that both of these projects today were are projects that I'm interested in. As a matter of fact, I contacted Ms. Sodak two years ago. When I first came on the board, I found that property up there and uh, contacted her then. And she wasn't ready to sell it at that point. And uh, so now it's just come up and, and we're ready to, to rock and roll. And that's why I'm here with her tonight in, in support because she was a little worried about coming. Um, it's hard to do new things when you're when you're living up in the woods and you come out of the woods. But anyway, <laughs> so I tell you what, Ramon Gavarazzi would love to have all that rock. He's already said to move it in a week. You know, and you think about the roads that we could possibly fix with the lime rock. I come from western Kentucky. I'm used to lime rock lakes and rivers. And so, you know, the idea of having the sheer ledges there like that to me are beautiful. As an art teacher, I think that's beautifully aesthetic. And, um, but like I say, we had the Army Corps of Engineers that dug out land between the lakes. I don't know if any of you all are familiar with that area or not, but the big line rock, rock cliffs there, you know, that afford awfully good fishing there. Uh, my concern was water quality to begin with as it tapped down into the aquifer. Um, I felt like that we could handle some of that with electric motors and uh, canoes, kayaks, that sort of thing, fishing. Um, Fish and Game, I think, is the perfect partner for, for this, this kind of a project. And um, from what I understand, Andy, when you all look at this again, I think, Linda, there's only one road that goes in. Right. 
the, the other roads are along, they they're, the they're blocked. Edge. They're they're blocked along um, power lines and, and you know, just keep other people from going in and that sort of thing. So it would be easy, I think, to monitor who goes in and comes out, especially even if you set it up um, as appointments. You know, I mean, if you set reservations, there are a lot of places, you know, that reserve space and time. And that's but there are ways you all will figure all that. It'll, it'll. But I just want you to know that uh, she's here because I encouraged her to be here starting two years ago because I saw the, the potential in this pr uh, protecting this area for the water. I know that Newberry is getting ready to set up a lime rock pit as a as somebody bought it to put in a hang uh, what is it a zip line zip line, line. Zip line things and you know so so they are beginning to attract attention and uh, so we're not too far off the mark. The second piece, um, the the old sod farm is what we call it. I've been on the I was on the Santa Fe Lake Dwellers Board for a long 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 time and I know that those people over there really would like to have been able to get that protected. Because at the time, the sod farm, you know, we could put pines up there again, you know, long leaf pine, replant it, something to get to reestablish, you know, a wildlife order or peace. But anyway, I know that that group would, would have been real interested in having that too. And I, I didn't know if there was any, do you raise your hand during these no. conversations or not? So that's why I'm waiting for public comment. But um, I know because of the use of uh, fertilizers and the amount of water that they did to keep that sod farm going, they were concerned about the runoff into the lake. So, you know, I appreciate what you're doing. It's really important work. And uh, I'm, I'm done. Thank you all so much for all Thank that. you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you very much. Is, is there any other uh, comments from the public? Yes. yes. Yeah. I do have one. There are people that are interested in this property that approached me two years ago, too. They want to make kind of like a racetrack out of it, which I don't think would be environmentally good, which I'm not interested in that, but I mean, you know, if we get down to what we have to do, we have to do it. But um, I always thought, when I started hearing about all the things you were purchasing, I always thought what we had would be a wonderful thing for that, for recreation. But that's why I was so excited. Two years ago, I was involved with something else, and I didn't want to get involved with it with the stress of everything. And but now, you know, I'm excited about it because I think it would be a wonderful place for you know the public to come and enjoy the. I mean, it's just a beautiful place there. And like I said, I'd much rather see this than somebody come in and bring dirt and have bikes out there messing up everything. So, but you know, you get down to you do what you have to do. But you know, <laughs> I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further com public comment? We no further public. I think that's everything that's it. for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I need a motion to uh, adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Do I hear a second? Second. Yep. Thank you. All those, uh, uh, any further discussion? Nope. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We look forward to hearing from you in uh, June. And uh, Dr. Amanda, thank you very much for your service. Thank you, everybody. Best of luck and wish me luck, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Amanda. Bye. 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 Maybe I'm misremembering, but I thought we concluded that we did not need a motion to adjourn, adjourn at the chair. Yes, you do. Oh, no, no, you do. Who wants the cute? I'm taking it. I'll take it. Or, no, I shouldn't take them all. Whatever. Thanks, Paul. You're welcome. I eat more than I should. Yeah. Well, that's all right. <laughs> no, like most things you plant your garden, I'll get right before. Yeah, I know. That's, that's the downside. Uh, I was very good. Yeah. Uh,